Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. With us, we have our esteemed CIO panel. Um, John Sherman mentioned in his remarks that he's established an ICCIO panel across the community to further integration um, of our capabilities. Up here, we have the very, CI very ICCIOs that represent that panel. And what's unique about this group of folks is that it rep represents the challenges that we have in both large and small agencies. Uh, while many of our objectives are the same, our missions are also different. So along with that brings different sets of challenges. I'd like to start by introducing our panel. In the back left-hand row is Mr. Mark Hawken, who is the Deputy CIO for the National Security Agency. Next to him is Mr. Eric Downs, the Deputy CIO and Chief Data Officer for the U.S. Coast Guard. Next to Eric is Colonel Doug Hayes, U.S. Air Force CIO for Intelligence, Surveillance, Reconnaissance. And then moving to the front row is Mr. <laughs> Mark Andrus, who is the CIO for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Next to Mark is Julianne Galina, CIO and Director of Information Technology Enterprise at the Central Intelligence Agency. Mr. John Sherman, ICCIO, who we heard from earlier. And then finally our host, Mr. Jack Gumto, CIO for the Defense Intelligence Agency. So we have several questions which we'll start with. Uh, and I'll start by asking you, during the past several years, as we've traveled the iSight journey, we've come across several cloud myths. The IC's new cloud strategy helps provide the basis for a decision-making framework, which John Sherman talked about earlier, to evaluate the benefits and challenges to using cloud services. So based on your experience, what are some of the guiding principles you recommend for cloud adoption versus staying on premise? And we'll start with you, Jack. Yeah, I was gonna say, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to, to take some of that. Um, so in the past, and I've talked to some, some people out here on this, and, and this is not new to my colleagues on the stage, it's been a strategy of everything must go to the cloud. It's got to be all in. And so the, the technical aspect of it was, is it technically feasible? If it is, put it in the cloud. What we've come to learn over the last few years, that's not sufficient. Um, it, it ends up having additional problems that are associated with that. Uh, so what we've done at DIA is implemented two other criteria. The second criteria is, does it provide a mission impact? Does that functionality support them? Because in many cases, by the tyranny of distance, it does not. And the third part is doing business cost analysis. It is not always cheaper to go directly to the cloud. There's two parts to that. One is, if you just re-host, you end up with a, a fixed bill for the lifetime of where that's hosted in there. And the second part of that is, it doesn't always make sense based on when you do the business cost analysis because of that fixed cost versus I have to do a spike to purchase on-prem equipment, but I can amortize that over several years. Um, and so you've got to look at those deltas. It's not as simple as oh, let's go in the cloud. Any others? Yeah, what would you share on that, Julianne? I, I would love to uh, talk about the cost aspects of cloud because I do think that there's a myth that moving to the cloud is always less expensive. That's proven, and I'll just speak from an industry perspective, um, having recently returned and, and looking at statistics from Forrester and Gartner and 451 Research, where what I've learned from the reading is that we're really still in the early days. And so we may have some uh, learning to do about how to be cost effective in cloud. They say, um, these experts are saying that less than 20% of commercial industries have actually migrated to cloud for some workloads. And of those workloads, only 35% of their enterprise are in the cloud. So it's really still early days. Yeah. Some of the things that they point to for reasons why cloud hasn't returned um, on investment for a commercial industry are the following. One, one is the initial cost to do the refactoring of applications before other types of compute into, um, into the cloud is unanticipated. People really aren't anticipating what it, what's required to refactor the code in particular. Sometimes the lift and shift, as Jack was mentioning before, that approach of just taking some kind of workload and moving it with the same architectural approach into the cloud is suboptimal. And we know that um, it's better to be thoughtful um, and Right now, in, in our journey at our agency, we realize that we may have 
moved quickly to the cloud and now we have to think about how to really optimize and our partners in industry are helping us with that. But the third reason is kind of a paradox. The third reason for increased costs in cloud, is, in, in the reading, I thought this was interesting. If you like history, it turns out there's this thing called Jevons paradox. If, if there are economists out there, maybe you're familiar with it. But it goes back over 100 years. 1865, this British economist was writing about the paradox. Why was the use of coal going up when recent technology advances had made it more efficient to use coal? You could produce more power with coal than in years previous. And it's a similar phenomenon. It turns out that if you make it really efficient to use a resource, people use it more. So this is a great thing for our agency and, and what we're seeing across the community as, as the acquiring office for C2S is that there's tremendous growth in the use of cloud and overall we're spending more. Sure. Um, so it, it is costing us more, but hopefully there's mission benefits. Um, and it's back to Jack's point, what we're trying to understand is how do you quantify the benefit in mission terms um, instead of just economic terms? Yeah, very good points. Mark Andrus, speaking of challenges, uh, you had a lot of lessons learned on the data yeah. side. Can you speak from NGA's perspective? Yeah, I mean, I'll build off a lot of uh, what Jack and Julianne said, and I think I'd look at it from the, from the opportunities that it present where we are in the journey. So yes, we are um, just starting the journey, but we're pretty far along, and we've got a lot, of, a lot of applications, a lot of data, a lot of things going on that give us that opportunity to look and learn um, from two perspectives. First, the first one is really inside NGA, and what we're learning is um, lessons that we can apply to our cloud assessment tools we've developed for any new application, um, things that have gone well, things that have not, criteria we try to share. But really looking at the usage data, um, usage data both in terms of storage and compute to really help you inform what you're doing. So we've been doing a lot of uh, report generation for our program managers. Um, and this has been really powerful because it allows the program manager th to then go sit with the mission owner and say, hey, I know cloud's a utility, right? But water and electricity are utilities, and if your daughter leaves the faucet on all day, you're not going to get good cost out of that water bill, right? Same thing with cloud. You really got to look at the data, which is what we're trying to do and let them have a discussion that just says, hey, if you look at these spikes in your usage, <coughs> what's causing that? Um, do you realize you're doing this? And if you did it this way, you might reduce your cost for no net deficit in, in mission. So data um, from what we've learned so far has been very effective for us. The second area, and it relates to learning and um, um, John mentioned it on our, our role with the SIPR or Secret Cloud. Um, we've, we've started developing what we'll call tiers of support for non-NGA customers to help them out as they start their journey into the cloud. And in simple terms, tier one would just be kind of, hey, here's our cloud assessment tool. You're welcome to use it. Uh, here's our cookbook of best practices, and here's some training. Go to town. If that's all you need, call us back if you got questions. The second one would be, hey, here's our platform that we've used and found effective, the services, the access controls. Um, feel free to use these if you'd like. And then the, th the third tier would be a full up round. Hey, you're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're just gonna basically give us your data, you're gonna control your accesses, and you're gonna create your apps, but you're gonna leverage all of NGA's secret cloud fabric um, to include security services. So I think that's, you know, kind of, we got challenges, but we're also learning a lot, and I think that we can do a lot. That's one of our most powerful elements of, of being an intelligence community, is that we can share and learn and uh, continuously try to optimize. Yeah, thank you, good perspectives. Mark, also, from a large agency's perspective, especially with data, what could you share? So uh, I'm looking at the, t the term myth, and I think one of the things that helped get us over the hump from, from a whole, especially with Scott Miller out there and the HIPSI staffers, is that NSA is actually using C2S. We are actually probably late, later than adopting C2S, but we are looking at what we can do in that environment. 
as John mentioned, we also have IC GovCloud, but they are two fundamentally different use cases of, if we're gonna call it collectively, the cloud. But we are looking at ways of benefiting both, and all the agencies up here in some form or another are actually benefiting from both of them in their own respective ways. And I think that as a collective, we are showing that we are doing that as a combined benefit to the nation of what we can actually deliver, both from the high-performing analytic environment, which is IC GovCloud, but the capacities and compute capabilities that uh, C2S brings and, and C2E will bring in the future. Uh, and another concern or discussion with cloud is that everything doesn't have to go to the cloud or that ubiquitous, what is the cloud? Uh, as a quote my boss, the CIO at uh, NSA, Greg Smithberger, is the speed of light still does matter. So when you're talking about where do you put things, depending on what you're trying to do, if you're trying to do a high performance uh, analytic compute, it doesn't necessarily need to uh, have that environment on the other side of the country. Because even, like, if, if I wanted to go touch General Howard's data in, in New Zealand 8,800 miles away, that's still 50 mi uh, milliseconds in round-trip data. So you have to watch where you put things depending on what you want to do with them. Some of those things would live in that environment perfectly fine. But as with the architectures and what you're building and delivering, you have to take all that into account. Geography does matter. Use does matter. Use cases do matter. So collectively as a whole, that's what we're working on with the data reference architecture and with the collaboration architecture. So all those are collectively as a whole what this body has been doing over the last year, year and a half I've been on it. Great, thank you. You've all hit on the importance of data and data strategies. And John, yesterday in your remarks, you talked about EyeSight Epic 2 and the focus on data services. Could you describe where we're going with that and how it could be a game changer for the community as a whole? Absolutely, Doug. As I mentioned, our partnership with our CDO colleagues has been at really critical in this. We have some joint governance sessions with them. Lene and I have the chance to meet frequently with Nancy and uh, her deputy. We talk a lot in the CIO Council, the members you see up here, about data services. And indeed, I mentioned we made some significant investments in data services in the past couple of years. I would say there's a chicken and egg issue here we've talked about for the past couple of years. And in hindsight, should we have leaned in a little bit sooner on data services? Maybe. But one thing I've noticed in this job for the past two years, we can focus the enterprise on two to three really heavy lifts at any given time. I mean, this is nature of anything, whether it's a military command or a large organization. And I think we put our shoulder hard into areas like the cloud compute piece, where, again, I would argue we're leaders in that area. The effort we're making on cybersecurity and to really lock things down there now. And with the CDO over the past year or two, now we're coming ashore on the data services piece. With the investments, now that we've got the compute in place, we've the network issues we continue to not only benefit from, but continue to work out with JWICs and so on, as, as was mentioned earlier this morning. And that we've got to get this right. My predecessors, and this was all with good intent, you know, we would use taglines of tag the person, tag the data. Data is an IC asset. But I think you all in the audience know that many times this was just too aspirational. I said in Omaha last year at the CenturyLink Center that fundamentally 9-11 was a data issue. And there were other issues, legal and culture, but we had the data and we didn't share it. And now we're even in a much more threatening environment between asymmetric threats, state actors, uh, everything from special operations up to high end, uh, conventional force combat, we're going to have to be able to support all of this. And if we don't unlock that data that we expend so much blood and treasure on, whether human beings going into dangerous areas or very expensive collection platforms that we've developed with our taxpayer money, shame on us if we don't share that data, make it available, tag it properly. So this is what we're working on on the CIO panel, and I would welcome other comments on that. Yeah, thank you. So Eric. A lot of dependencies across the community on data from your perspective in the Coast Guard. Could you share where we're going? Sure. So I'm, uh, I represent the smallest of the IC elements up here on stage. And without even a hint of uh, exaggeration, the, we are the most unique of all the elements in the IC. And I, I, I say it because we're a military service. We're not in DOD. We're a law enforcement agency. We're a regulatory agency. We uh, do search and rescue. We do operations in both polar regions. We do a lot of things. We have 11 statutory missions, touching eight U.S. titles. Um, and since I've been in the Coast Guard, working with the Coast Guard for the past three years, everybody wants to talk to me. Even people who didn't want to talk to me when I spent 12 years uh, working in DOD want to talk to me now. And I tell all of my friends in uniform, it's because they're really awesome people. 
but it's also because we do have all those authorities and that ties to the data piece. Our challenge on data is that our data is locked in legacy systems uh, that were great and they still serve a purpose, but they're not interoperable with our enterprise systems in IC, and they're also on the secret and the unclassed fabric and not in the TSSCI. So we have some challenges. So our challenge is to move all of our data into the cloud architectures on all three levels and also move our capabilities. Uh, I should also mention that we are not overly burdened with excessive amounts of extra money. So being frugal is important to us. So when John pr points out that you know, one of the primary services of the second epic of iSight is IC data services, we called them up. And uh, we did that in the end of 2017, and they showed up en masse. Um, the first group was uh, Data Strategic Services. I think they recently changed their name, but same group. Um, and they work with us to move data into the integrated data layer of the C2S cloud. And then uh, shortly thereafter, we also worked with the IC Gov Cloud ingest team. Two phenomenal teams of people. I I'm just telling you, I've, I've been a CIO, Jack and I have talked about this sometimes. I've been a CIO for a long time. I think it's been 16 years, I think, uh, that I've been doing this. And, and CIOs know what it's like to work with really smart data people. They're always smarter than you are about data, and they always bring you unsolvable problems. These IC data services people have not met an unsolvable problem yet. They, so they approach data management from a completely different perspective. If you are a CIO or you are a CDO and you have not called them up, you need to call them and find out what they can do in conjunction with you because it's a phenomenal service and they're great people. I do have one other thing I want to say about data, though. Um, from the defense intel perspective, I believe we have a split personality when it comes to data, and we need to solve that quickly. I'll give you an example of why. Back in uh, the early part of May, I was over at DIA, I was at a conference, um, not an IC conference, it was an ISR conference, uh, two and three star admirals and generals, SES equivalents at the two and three star level from the um, services, combatant commands, uh, combat support agencies, and the five eyes partners. All talking about ISR and process and exploitation and dissemination challenges. For two straight days, I watched these executives um, complain about, worry about, discuss data problems, data management. What was notable was not one member of the IC Chief Data Officer Council was in the meeting. And I don't think it's because we weren't invited. I think it was because somebody forgot to invite us or didn't think about it because it was USDI and the joint staff that was holding the meeting and it wasn't somebody from the IC side. But the chief data officers from the services worked for the same people. They worked for the people from the services and from the combat support agencies. It just didn't occur to them that if they got data challenges, they might want to get the CDOs involved. And at the same time, I brought that information back to the CEO council and people were kind of mildly interested in the topic, but you know, it's like, well, we got a lot of other things to do. We'll get to that later. But I don't think we can get to it later because otherwise what we're going to end up with is two silos of excellence that are non-intersecting and not interoperable. And I think we've got to make sure that we don't do that or otherwise the operational commanders are going to be looking at us and saying, wow, that's really great. You've got to cloud optimize, IT modernize, whatever it is, and two stovepipes that don't talk to each other. How's that different than what we had before? So I think we got to make sure that we don't let that happen. You know, the funding sources can't split our brain in half. We've still got to figure out a way to pull that together. But um, IC Davis Services may be a part of that. Again, if you haven't called them and you're a CIO and a CDO, you need to give them a call because they're awesome people. Yeah. So, so Mark Hawk and NSA, other end of the spectrum in terms of size of the agency, also obviously leading the way on data services. So, what can you share about So this? we still have that same unsolvable problem is we are not getting less data. Nobody's turned off their cell phones, nobody's going back to the way we were with notepads and paper. We're, we are not getting less data, which means we can't store all the data in one spot. We will never catch up with being able to store all the data in one spot. So in order to solve that and what these unsolvable problems is, first, you have to know what you have, what your sources are. If you know what your sources are, and then to, to Mark's point earlier about metrics and then show what, you're, what data you're actually using. Because you may be collecting things you're never actually using, so in that case, do you need to store it as long? Do you, do you be able to, to move it into, into cold storage and just archive it so it's there if you need it? So these are all the factors data services we'll be able to take into account as we put metrics on the systems, as we give data back to us and our CDOs to know what, what keywords, phrases, data sources are we using and we're actually getting benefits from. With, with the team as a tag it, 
as it comes in, so it's more structured. That allows us to go do a better inventory, and these are all things we've been collectively directed, well, John says he directs us to go do it. We all make that in a collaboration fashion. Does this make sense to go do? And it does make sense to catalog all that. So that's why I'm excited to see about as we get the next year, get the metrics on the data and what we're actually using and, and give it our, our return on investment. Because we've actually been able to make headway on what we're able to keep and make it more actionable and actually give ourselves a little bit more lead time in our, our storage environments. Yeah. So we heard from Gene Schaefer earlier on the importance of security. Uh, and, and as our chief security officer here at DIA, and I hear a lot from folks in the audience, a lot of folks at, at DIA, of what can we do to speed up the accreditation process. So Colonel Hayes, what are the, some of the things that you, you're working on to speed up our time to ATO? Well, well first I'll say that uh, cybersecurity gets a bad rap from many in the community, right? So we're operating, we're managing risk, and I think we do that every day, whether you're a cybersecurity expert or whether you're an operational commander, at some point in your job, you are assessing risk, determining whether you're gonna accept risk or how you're gonna manage that risk. But when you put that F word at the end of risk management, and I mean, framework, right? Not, not, not the other one. I know that one's, that one's probably used a lot before RMF, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so what we're, uh, so yeah, we're, we realize that uh, the RMF requires a lot of work to be done, a lot of documentation. It's to date been very manually intensive for how we've done it within Air Force ISR. So uh, I'm going to break this down with people, processes, and technology. Basically, we have a core group of cybersecurity experts within our enterprise who have been working to solve the problems of these manual processes, helping the customer, helping the users get their data into our RMF tool, uh, helping them to get the training they need to use the tool, and then more importantly, probably working with one another and collaborating from the users at the major command and the headquarters level or at our uh, MAGCOM uh, Air Combat Command level, just to identify roadblocks, problems within our processes and try and work through those. And a lot of that is not just within the military. We've reached out to our IC partners. We've worked with NGA. Uh, we've adopted some of NGA's ATO in a day processes. So we are taking, uh, there's, your, there's your, uh, your nod right there. Um, we're taking their processes, applying those to our unclass environment having apps that are being developed, and then putting those up into our SCI environment. So we have that DevSecOps pipeline uh, going. The other thing we've done uh, is work with uh, the IC and, once again, NGA. Uh, their revamp process, we've kind of modeled some of ours after that again. Um, and so we now, when you have a discovery meeting with the users or the customer, uh, basically, we are categorizing your system. We are identifying what level you are. You're either level one or level five, or level one, two, three, four, or five. And if you're level one, two, or three, you're eligible for a rapid ATO. And what we've done here is we've identified about 100 critical controls that you must do, and we figure those critical controls will take you, take one person around two to three weeks to get those implemented we will assess those uh, likely remotely or uh, on site. But once those are done, you will get a 12, nine or six month ATO, but you're not done. You still have more controls that you will need to implement. So we're not saying you don't have to worry about anything else. We're just trying to get capability to the airmen faster, right? With the, we want it secure to them. But then again, we also understand that there's more that needs to be done, which takes time and over time, if we, follow the old methods of doing business, wait till you get a full ATO and every control is uh, in place, you're talking months to a year or more. So the last thing we've done now, we talked about uh, the people, a little bit of the processes. Uh, now we're going to talk a little technology and automation. So like most of the folks in the intelligence community, or I think all the folks in the intelligence community, we use Exacta as our RMF tool. And we partner with Exacta uh, in Telos. Uh, quite a bit. So they sit with us, they talk with us, they understand our problems, and they help us work through those problems. So this fall, um, we're coming out with our workflow 4.0, which is going to take that the first two things I mentioned, the processes 
and help the people and basically automate that. So we've got to, we're going to have the ability to take hardware and software, asset management tools. We're going to be able to ingest that information into our Xacta. So we're going to basically know our environment. We're going to be able to manage our envi environment. And we're going to be able to share that information with the IC, which will make Sue Dorr and Mr. Sherman very happy. But I'll say we're not done. This is just one step in the process. We're going to continually look at how we do business and try and make modifications over time to get quicker, to get more secure, and uh, help our airmen feel that capability sooner. Thank you. So Eric, you spoke earlier about seemingly unsolvable challenges. And if you ask most CIOs, they would say culture and organizational structure are amongst some of the hardest challenges that they're facing. So share some thoughts on what you think, some of the changes we could consider to make the IC more effective in those areas. OK, so uh, months ago, I was uh, in a pdd and is office, and John Sherman was in there as well. My, my boss, who's the uh, assistant uh, deputy commandant <clears throat> for uh, Intel and Coast Guard, was uh, giving a brief to her. And I was there to talk about our transition of data and capabilities into the cloud. And so John's sitting across the table from me, and I looked at Ms. Uh, Gordon, and I said, um, uh, what you need to know is uh, this is going to work. We're going to win. We're going to, because we're not going to stop. But I do want you to know that every single step of this process of moving data into the cloud and moving capabilities in the cloud is going to be hard. And John was nodding his head, because we both knew what. And, I, and she looked at us, and like, why is that? And I said, and it, it won't be a technical problem. It's not a technical challenge. The challenge is going to be everything other than the technical stuff. It's going to be policy. It's going to be culture. It's going to be resistance to change. It's going to be unknowns. It's going to be all those kinds of things. And we don't know what all those things are yet, but we're going to run into them. And we have run into them. On the data side, the good thing is the data services folks are working with us. We brought them challenges that, that have helped us to, uh, they, they, they want to work with us through those because they know that if they can work them out with the Coast Guard, then other agencies can, can um, can benefit from that. On the movement of data into, uh, or capabilities into the cloud, it becomes a little bit more of a challenge. We do have some people that resist going into the cloud, and they'll probably retire, and we don't have to worry about them. But, <laughs> but it's, the, it's, the, uh, <laughs> it's, the, it's the other part of it. I'm going to tell you, and I think there's probably people here, I mean, it's easy at the boardroom level to think that this doesn't actually happen. But in DOD and in DHS and other places, we are still largely in thing buying mode, right? We, we come up with requirements for things, we buy things, we sustain things, we keep them alive for a while. Then we, just, you know, we destroy the things, we buy a new thing. And uh, then, you know, all of a sudden you get into the cloud aspect and say, well, we're not going to buy a thing anymore. We're just going to pay a fee to this, this mythical service somewhere. And the whole acquisition world, the whole everything, contracts world, they don't know how to deal with that, especially when you're down at the agency level. They may be able to deal with that at the higher level, but it's a, it's a different thing. So people aren't really resistant necessarily, it's just a very big unknown. Um, so that's been, a, that's been a challenge for us. And the other thing is, um, I can tell you that we've, we, we don't even have a task order on the C2S contract, but we're a clin on somebody else's task order. And that's been okay, but that doesn't get you in the cloud. That's like getting a ticket to go into the forest. You still got to build a house. You still got to get the electricity in the house. You got to have an environment in the cloud to actually be able to operate. So if you don't know how to do that, then you're going to be struggling through something. So partnerships are really very vitally important for us. <clears throat> and we just happen on one, which is actually on Mark Anderson's team uh, over at NGA. We're going to be, in fact, I just told him yesterday, some of his engineers are going to spend three hours in my office on Friday because we're, we're now partnering with them on using their environment in the cloud. We're very excited about that. Um, I'm a little sad that we didn't think of that 12 months earlier, um, but we're at least going in that direction. So I would say for smaller agencies, it's really important that we find those partnerships, whether it's NGA, DIA, CIA, somebody who, can, who knows what they're doing and partner with them, that they've already learned a lot of those lessons. That'll help us to get through those, some of those cultural and organizational issues. We're going to have those anyway, because we always do. We're in the government, right? We, we work in a bureaucracy, and bureaucracy is always have a hard time with change. But as long as we can partner with others in the community that have done some of these things, I think we're going to be fine. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to that. Next year, I'll be telling you good stories about that. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. So Jack, we've been talking Absolutely. about culture and organization as we've been developing our new vision and strategy for DIA-CIO. 
share a few thoughts on where we're going with that. Yeah, I was hoping you weren't going to call me on that. <coughs> okay. Um, I, I, I actually can talk about culture for a long time. Um, all the way back to from my days at the Navy when I got elevated into the SES Corps as the Chief Knowledge Officer uh, and how to deal with culture. And culture is an incredibly difficult thing to address because it's, it's built for a reason. Um, and then when you try to change it, it's like turning that, that carrier. Um, you, you can spin the helm all the way over. You're just going to make little movements um, as you move forward. Um, but as I talked about yesterday, we, we put out our strategy. We've put out our, um, or we're close to putting out our um, uh, planning guidance. Um, I didn't know that, I think we had 300 copies of the strategy that was put in the, DO, uh, the DOTUS booth. It was sold out like gangbusters. Who knew? Um, but that's the start of how do we change the culture. It's like, okay, what is that guidepost that we're heading for? Um, let's start making small corrections in order to get there. Uh, it gets back to the point uh, Eric just mentioned. And he, he said, we're still in the mode, just as an example, we're in the mode of buying things. And, and then Doug, as you've heard from me previously, uh, I, I consider success in our endeavor to modernize CIO is if our workforce, and, and at DIA CIO it's roughly about 4,000 people, if they would take a moment and think before they actually go and do something, is there another way to do it? As a, just that little bit of movement to, to change it. Because rather than just go buy that thing and then destroy it and then repeat, is there a better way that we can do this thinking more strategically versus what do I need right at this moment? Yeah. So Mark, you've started uh, your position in April, right? Yeah. Coming into a new organization. <clears throat> what are some of your thoughts as you come in? Yeah, Julianne and I both started on April Fool's Day, didn't we? Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yes. So uh, the judgment is still out on who the joke was on, <laughs> uh, CIA, NGA, or us. But um, culture, it's, um, I love the culture issues. Um, I've always tried to attack the culture issues in two ways. One, shed light on them, get a conversation going on them. Don't let the culture issues hide in the deep, dark recesses of your organization. And the second thing is to attack it and prove what cultural aspect you're trying to change, demonstrate it. A couple of examples that I've seen since coming to NGA, um, one was uh, looking at data, um, building on a couple of the conversations you've heard here. Um, NGA, like all agencies, are facing huge data growth challenges, flat people, uh, no growth in, in our people um, counts, and um, looking for new ways to look at things. So NGA, um, a year back, they decided to form the data core. And what was neat about it was it was centrally managed so they could go out and hire a specific type model series of human that had specific skill sets that they could, they could uh, mentor, that they could train um, as kind of data ninjas. And then they pushed them out functionally across the command. So they put them in the business sector looking at uh, financial management, how to tackle the problems that they have there in a different way, HR, in analysis, and in our collections groups. Um, by that, but that central, you know, you can push people out, but unless those lessons are brought back up and they're not elevated up the command, you never get the rinse, wash, repeat cycle going from top leadership on down. So bringing them back into a central uh, group to share those success stories, elevates it up, the director, um, great visibility, and then all the senior leaders across go, wow, I need me, I want me some of that uh, data core cowbell, you know, a little more cowbell. Um, as they're looking at the trade-offs on whether to buy the next piece of gear, the next capability, or the next investment in a type of people with skill sets. So I think the, uh, I think going out and demonstrating it, um, even in small sample sets, can really attack that culture challenge. Yeah. Doug, if I can real, just sure. real quick, just give a plug for this entire group. Um, I've been a part of the ICCIO group since back ways. Um, probably precedes most of these guys on here. Um, Eric may be the one holdout. It, when we first came together as an ICCIO group, it was not as functional and bonded as it is right now. 
Um, and over time, that culture has changed where that rather than being 17 independent agencies operating on their own, uh, we have actually come together as a group um, in doing things for the IC and the DOD writ large versus just for our independent agency. And that's just a testament on the culture issue of how we have changed and recognized the benefit of doing that as a team. Uh, and it's to all these guys that are up here on the stage with me. And Jack, I was going to say the same thing. You know, when we talk about the accomplishments we've had in Second Epic, it truly is a team effort. Every one of the organizations and the leaders on this stage, plus many of our peers who aren't here today, um, have had a major, indeed critical input to all of this. And we stand together or we fall together. And Jack, I think you're right. We, our CIO councils get very candid sometimes, and they need to be as we work through these very tough issues. Because as I look out in the audience, I see military, government, industry, and others. This stuff is hard. Um, and if we don't have these tough discussions, we get into a group think or an easier solution that's not, you know, we take the easy left instead of the hard right. And I just want to publicly on this stage thank all my colleagues for this because we are a team. And I think you all need to hear that. This is one team, one fight. We don't say that lightly. And uh, I'm honored to be working with you all. Thank you, Jack. So last year, and John, you mentioned this in November, we had our ICCIO offsite. And we talked about the challenges that we needed to address in the coming year. And one of those topics we talked about was support to employees needing reasonable accommodations, employees with disabilities. Um, this came up for us in DIA last year when our director went to a picnic uh, with deaf and hard of hearing employees. And they talked about the challenges that they had in doing simple tasks that many of us take for granted, like calling family outside of work or making a doctor's appointment. And so we immediately started looking at what could we bring into the agency to help them with that. And so we looked at what NGA had done with video phones, what NSA had done, and immediately I noticed that we all had different configurations. And so we started to look at lessons learned, and this opened the aperture on 508 support to employees needing reasonable accommodations. Julianne, CIA has been tackling this issue as well, looking at some more advanced techniques with AI. Could you talk a little bit about where we're going there? Sure. I, I want to uh, really put a human face on this because it, it came home to me my first week in this position when um, it was brought to my attention that a young officer had entered on duty the previous fall, had been on duty with us about six months. Um, this person, this analyst was... Uh, a PhD in his chosen field, but had um, some disabilities that limited the use of his hands, so he only had a partial, he only has partial use of one hand. And we hadn't been able to get an accommodation for this officer in place yet, six months. I think, wow, you know, this, this person had essentially completed what is, to me, a heroic effort to earn a PhD um, despite this limitation and overcome all that, compete and be hired with us, go through that rigorous selection process interview, uh, the vetting and the hiring, which for our agency is, is very long, years sometimes. Um, and we couldn't get a solution. We could not get him a keyboard so he could do his work completely unacceptable. And it wasn't for lack of trying. There, there are significant security concerns that, that we have to deal with when devices enter into our spaces that are Bluetooth enabled. Um, it, it, is a, it can be a serious security question, but it's a, it, it has to be the intersection of smart risk management, risk acceptance, and leadership. And I'm really pleased to say that our agency has been leaning forward in this area and we, are, uh, we have a very active accessibility tiger team. Our diversity and inclusion office has demonstrated significant leadership here. And it's not a question of cost. It's really about how quickly can we come up with the technical solutions or and sometimes other accommodations for our officers to make sure that they can be as productive as possible and we can accommodate them. There's so much value there in this part of our workforce and we've sometimes been what may feel sluggish to respond. So um, our, my deputy, Kathleen Nair, is a senior advocate for um, accessibility. And we have a senior advocate in every directorate. 
There's also a subject matter expert in every directorate, and we have tiger teams, um, or working groups actually, that focus on specific issues. Um, really pleased also through the ICCIO Council to be participating in a larger group. So glad DIA um, has offered its leadership. Shannon Pascal is leading the, the community's efforts here, and we're really glad to contribute to that. Some of our training and some of our documentation, I think, has become part of the community standard. Shannon's considering that at least and I'm looking forward to working on it. But I, I never want to be um, the reason, as an accreditation official in my agency, I never want to be that reason why uh, a person cannot be fully productive in our environment. We, it takes leadership. Right. So as DIA has been building our reasonable accommodation program, we've looked across the agency, uh, the state of maturity of other capabilities that we have. Um, outside in the IC, CIA and NSA have certainly <laughs> served as the models that we're following across the broader IC. Mark, can you talk about, from NSA's perspective, where we're going? So I was sort of talking yesterday about the workforce and how do we retain people and make, make sure we're uh, fully effective as, a, as an IC. It would be uh, not a good look on us to disadvantage 10% of the workforce that has some type of disability, whether that be sight or hearing or a mobility aspect of it, color blindness, t tension disorder. Uh, from walking the, the hall, seeing all the technologies that's out there, uh, we should be able to solve these things in rather short order. So I'm gonna put the challenge out to you is, is either your view as a program manager, your view as an industry partner or your view as just a user or another human being is to demand of those capabilities you're buying and procuring that those accessibility dimensions are included when you buy that up front. Now, to help you gauge whether you can go do that or not is we work with CIA and DIA to come up with a, a scoring capability because you get what you measure, and if, but if you don't measure how well your application or service or web page is doing relative to those simple things that a blind person would need to do to go tab to a picture and not find it, be able to describe what the picture is. We can solve all those things. So I'm gonna put a plug in for the panel that's happening at 1600 today in the accessibility, I believe, room, room 22. Go learn how you can, as one of those three capacities, help your workforce in, in, in some manner get to the next step. Uh, and given the fact with technology, I'll, I'll pull up what, as I've been doing research on this in, in my role as deputy CIO, is something called the curb cut effect. So I was sometime in the early 70s in Berkeley, some engineers got out with a jackhammer because one of their friends got back from the war and was in a wheelchair and couldn't cross the street other than ducking cars in the middle. So they went and built a curb. Well, that curb for the wheelchair also had the benefit of the lady with the stroller pushing the baby across the street now and now had a place to go across. Or the, the the delivery person now had a place to go pull his uh, load of goods up from the street into the store. So we can go do that with technology. Uh, a young lady up here doing sign language. Well, we have the capability now to do capturing of speech. So we can go put that on a screen or such where we, where we can add benefit to those who necessarily can't uh, hear us, but can see, either see the words or understand the, the, the motions of the sign language. I mean, some of you at the, the social last night with the bar watching Monday Night Football probably want to know what the announcers were, so there's it's captioning on there. Again, curb cut effect. Something benefit for somebody at a bar is also benefit that the user who can't hear. So there's ways we can go do this with technology and get much better because we have too many people who can give us benefit that we aren't taking advantage of. Yeah, good point. I add one thing to this too. Um, we very appropriately put our shoulder into diversity all across the interagency, race, gender, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, I can go down the list. We are not going to take our foot off the gas on persons with disabilities or medical device needs. You know, people ask me kind of what keeps me up at night or what concerns me. My concern is that PhD that Julianne just described or any number of other officers she or he is the one that's going to make the big fine. I look in the front row and see some of our combatant leaders. I see my friend Keith Lawless there from SOCOM. That officer might be the one that finds the actionable target that our special operators go in this night and shut down a major threat to the homeland. And so shame on us if it comes down to a keyboard this officer needs or speech to text capability that an officer at NSA needs so she can provide that critical bit of SIGIN analysis that gets down to Keith's folks down the road at McDill here. 
um, so they can action down forward at a target here. That's what keeps me up a little bit. And we're going to need all of your help on this. It's not just a compliance issue. We're going to go well above and beyond compliance. And thank you, DIA, for helping honcho this and, and taking these best practices and leading us on as an enterprise. We're going to need all of you out in the audience to come along with us on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our topic for this year's DOTUS conference is adapting to asymmetric threats. And as CIOs, what have been some of the more <laughs> notable challenges you've experienced in this changing threat and environment? We'll start with you, Mark. Yeah, it's, this, is, um, <clears throat> this is a topic that I've spent a lot of time at the Pentagon with the Navy looking at over the last several years. Um, and really looking at near-peer threats in one of the most difficult, I would consider one of the most difficult IT communications environment is our sailors out at sea, right? You don't have a lot of the same benefits that we have uh, on, the, on the terrestrial side, um, and it's just hard. We do have sheets and air conditioning. In the they do have sheets and air conditioning, <laughs> just not a lot of sleep. Right. <laughs> um, but some of the challenges and, and things that I've observed as uh, we study these types of things and how to uh, attack them, and really more or less pitfalls, is there's always a, tendi, a, a, a trend to go and be captivated by the most stressing, um, fascinating thing that our adversary is doing because it's sexy, it's cool, and you're like, wow, we gotta, we gotta go after that, we gotta mitigate that, and we do. But it tends to draw your attention away from what I will call blocking and tackling, and everyone in this room that deals with any amount of cyber knows that that's, that remains the most persistent attack vector. Um, and you can take that same thought that I just described of always chasing the shiny hardest object but not having your fundamentals down. Um, and, and that's a real big challenge. So when we talk about resiliency and we talk about redundancy, you know, forget, forget trying to set up redundant servers at place X, Y, and Z or a complex failover or a cyber hunt mission if you don't even have your basic people processes patching uh, fundamentals down. So I think the fundamental thing on looking at these is get the basics right, invest in those. Um, the second thing is you got to focus really specifically on the threats that you're going after um, and, and really try to marry that up with the theater that you're operating in, the mission owner, what the commander wants to do, what, the, what he thinks the adversary is going to do, and tabletop that and really start to break down all the different pieces before you decide to go invest in more equipment. I think somebody mentioned it earlier. We, we tend to, a lot of our response tends to go for the equipment. Um, when we, we could think through, hey, if I've already got equipment in places A, B, and C, can I change my people and process equation and create a, a level of resiliency and redundancy without the tail cost? So I think those are some of the big challenges that I've seen and pitfalls that I've seen as we try to approach this. Thank you. Colonel Hayes, how about from your perspective in the Coast Guard? So as Mark was saying, I think the, I mean, uh, yeah. the issues we deal with are going to be well, the advantages that we have today in today's fight are not going to be there in the future when we go up against great power competition. So today we are collecting a lot of data and we are sending that data across networks back to a major processing node somewhere, CONUS or OCONUS, and someone is looking at that data and they're coming up with a product and they're providing that product to a decision maker, the warfighter, the operational commander, et cetera. In the future, we see that, uh, that cyber link, those networks not being there. So what we are focused on is uh, coming up with a concept called uh, the collaborative sensing grid. Okay, and as part of this collaborative, collaborative sensing grid, it maps to the multi-domain operations, which ties together all domain, space, cyber, uh, maritime, land, and sea. Oh, I said maritime. So anyway, uh, ties all five domains together. Uh, so anything we're collecting on those, we want to be able to process as close to the edge as possible. What is the edge? Is the edge a platform in space? Is it an airborne platform? Is it a ship? Or is it somewhere, some node forward where that information is coming down and we can leverage machines and AI ML to determine what a target is or where that target is and then provide just that amount of data that the warfighter needs 
to that decision maker or to that weapon system so that we can take out that target. So challenges, we have a lot of challenges ahead because we need to understand what this capability is. We need to figure out how to get that edge compute you know, as close to the edge or as close to the platform as possible. And these things are going to take us a little bit of time as we work through with our partners in the IC and the DOD to come up with this architecture and implement that solution and see it through to execution. Thank you. So shifting our focus on workforce, and we've talked a lot about that through this conference and in the talks that we've had thus far. So as technology is evolving, our workforce needs are also evolving, along with the changing skills uh, that we need to retain in our community. What are some of those, and uh, we could start with Julianne, that we're looking so at. I, I think it's, I'll be repeating what everyone knows. Um, we clearly need to be able to re recruit the very best cyber talent as well as data scientists and developers. Uh, but I also think one, one gap that we have that's probably not as well known is the need to hire profession, um, professional program management experts, COTARs, and contracts officers. Um, I, I listen um, to industry, and I would tell you that the two things that I hear the most as, as negative feedback, and everyone's very, very polite in, in sharing this with me, but. Um, our accreditation process, how we deal with that risk management framework, um, getting systems accredited, and how we buy are, are the biggest pain points that I hear about over and over again. And whenever I work with the team internal to our agency to understand how do we fix this and what do we need to do, it always comes back to a shortfall in, in uh, qualified talent, especially in COTAR skills, and, and that can have different terms, COR, COSR, in different agencies. Um, but that's an, a, a real focus for us right now, and we're doing a lot of things internal to ITE or IT enterprise um, to remediate that. I'd also say, say that there's something also subjective that I'm looking for in our officers, and that's um, the, one of the best things about coming back to this agency is working again with people who are willing to solve and try to solve any problem, no matter how big or small, so that aptitude and desire to just solve problems and the ability to do so is really awesome. But I think we also need to have um, some skill building in resilience, grit, um, and creativity. I, I think that uh, we might be able to find some of those skills by having different kinds of creative exchanges with industry because I do think that, you know, Capitalism really drives a lot of creativity and grit and determination. And the skills that we have among so many of you here in the audience and our industry counterparts is to understand what it's like to solve a problem within the constraint of, uh, of real um, profit and loss boundaries. So I would love to see more rotation with industry, uh, even if that means micro exchanges or cohorts where we're just doing it for very short periods of time. But I think our middle managers who are dealing with acquisition challenges in our agency really need to understand what's, what's happening on the industry side and how to understand what your challenges are. I think we'll be able to work together better if we do. Yeah. I'd like to leverage off that just for a moment. <clears throat> I'm the uh, IT career field manager for, for DIA. Um, one of the things that we're doing to the point you made about the cores and the COTARs is we're looking at Sharon Harrington runs the, the division for me that does um, personnel talent management. Implementing when we hire people as GS7s coming out of school that we get them DIWEA 1, DIWEA 2 certified. So they may not be a core, but it gives them a baseline across that, that as they grow, as they become program managers and that they have that basis and we have a professional cadre of personnel that understand how to do those business acumen. Um, so that's, that's one of the approaches that we're doing, uh, just to hit on, on that piece. I also believe on, with regard to hiring people, I think, you know, I've heard in the past we've had a difficult time hiring people. Um, I've looked at some of the stats recently. I don't think that is as bad as what we make it out to be. I will tell you that within, within my group, um, we are doing pretty well of hiring people with STEM related degrees um, and bringing them in. I will tell you that we've not done a really good job of necessarily placing them in the right technical positions um, and we're taking a, a dedicated look at that and saying how do we get them in there because I've got a, a, an incredibly talented workforce that I don't think that I'm managing correctly uh, to address some of these problems that we're facing. Yeah. 
So Eric, I'm really curious from a Coast Guard perspective, being a smaller element of the IC, right. what you're seeing. So uh, what's been really remarkable for me uh, is to see particularly the talent that's in uniform in the Coast Guard. And I'm not sure exactly how we solve this, but uh, we have this um, commander that's actually here with us today. She works with us as our champion for all the AI work, all the artificial intelligence stuff. And she, she's been really good at identifying all these people that are out there that, that may, maybe the Coast Guard trained or maybe they got trained on their own that have these skills, these remarkable skills that could be of benefit with AI or other advanced technologies. They just don't happen to be in those jobs right now. And so we're trying to work with some of the senior leaders in the Coast Guard to figure out a way to leverage some of that capability. And other services may have the same challenge. Some of these younger folks that are joining the service, services now, I mean, they were coming in with skills that well, didn't even exist 10 years ago or maybe even five years ago. So uh, I, I think that there's, there's a way to do that, and we're, we're going to try to see what we can do to try to figure out how to, how to leverage those capabilities. But, but um, some of the younger folks that I've seen joining the Coast Guard, even, even at the enlist, enlisted level in the Coast Guard, I mean, it's not uncommon to find somebody with a master's degree in some high-tech field. And I'm, I've seen that many times now. So, so I think that we've got a workforce, particularly in uniform, at least in the Coast Guard, I would imagine in the other services, that if we work with our military partners, we can figure out a way to, uh, to gain a lot more advantage for the defense and the national security side than we already are. So that's been the real eye-opening experience for me. I mean, there's been great people in the Coast Guard across the board, uh, contractors, civilians, and in in uniform, but in uniform in particular is the thing that's been a real surprise for me is to see how tremendously remarkable they are and particularly the younger the younger officers and the younger enlisted folks are really something else. I just uh, really really yeah. been remarkable. So. so Colonel Hayes on that topic. Yeah. Uh, if if I can leverage off of what Eric's been yeah. saying here. So right, there is a lot of talent across the Air Force and one of the uh, key concepts that we have coming forward is what's called a computer language initiative. And this is kind of like the human language initiative, right? So if you know how to speak a language, you get paid a certain amount if you're proficient to, uh, to be able to speak that language. Same thing applies with computer languages. So if you know Python, if you know R, et cetera, well, there's a test that you will take. And depending on how we, well you do on that test, uh, you will be assigned a proficiency level. And you'll be coded in a certain manner that identifies you as knowing you know, Python, for instance. And it doesn't matter what Air Force specialty code you are. You could be a logistician. You could be a security forces person. You could be cyber or intel. If you have that skill set, you're going to be called upon at some point to do some of that work, to do some coding. So there's a lot of innovation going on within the Air Force at the wing and unit level. And those are the airmen that are going to be called upon to do things for our Air Force. Great. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate the insights, as does the audience that you've shared with us today on a variety of topics. Thank you very much. Let's give them all a round of applause. All right. Yep. All right. Thank Thanks. you, sir. Thank you. Good job. Nice job. Thank you, Juliana. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay. With that, we're going to get set up for our new speaker. I did want to highlight that we are still taking questions on our Gmail account, which is askdotus at gmail.com. We will be responding to them throughout the course of this conference. And the director was serious when he meant it, as was Jack, that we will go through all of those questions that you have. Even if there are hundreds of thousands of them, we will get to them. So thank you very much for your participation. I also wanted to highlight, if you haven't downloaded the app, please do so. Um, you can get it in the App Store uh, for the DOTUS conference. It has all the schedule changes, so it is updated live as we make the changes throughout the day. Our next speaker, who will be coming up momentarily, will join us, General Stephen Lyons. So we'll get started very shortly. Is he ready? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we're actually ready to go. General Lyons is with us. Wanted to give a short introduction. Um, General Lyons is the commander of U.S. Transportation Command. He has extensive leadership experience spanning over 35 years of military service. He began his career in Germany during the Cold War and subsequently led a wide range of assignments to include the command of troops at every level, multiple operational deployments, and over six years of experience in joint assignments. 
As a battalion commander in 2003, he led more than 1,200 soldiers as part of the 3rd Infantry Division's ground assault to liberate Baghdad. And since 2003, he spent more than 40 months deployed to the U.S. Central Command. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome General Stephen Lyons. Thank you. I was in the back chatting with uh, Jack, just catching up. And uh, hey, well, thanks. And uh, I got General Ashley out here. Is he off doing something? Hey, I appreciate uh, appreciate the invite from uh, DIA. And I was, uh, as I was reading, you know, as I was doing my IPB, just a little bit late, coming down in the plane this morning. Uh, I realized how tech intensive this is. And I realized how tech intensive I'm not. So maybe it's a perfect match. You, you probably, the invitation probably needed to go to my CIO, Rob Lyman, who just happened to be on leave, so it's your unlucky day. Uh, but I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to talk to you. What I'd like to do, uh, actually, is probably, you know, after that CIO panel, which I understand was phenomenal, uh, take you back up probably to about 40,000. And then at the end, uh, I'm going to come back to, if you got in the Q&A session anyway, I'll save a bit of time to talk about uh, what Transcom is doing with regard to data, big data, uh, cloud, and some of our IT optimization initiatives which are critical to our defense transportation enterprise. So you can appreciate that we are a data-intensive organization. And uh, we see it very similar to the intelligence community that the that data is central to our ability to succeed in bringing and leveraging computing technology, right, and, and being able to move beyond advanced analytics to machine learning and AI and these types of technologies. But let me first kind of give you a perspective, I guess, from a geographic, a, 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 a global, I should say, a COCOM commander with functional responsibilities. And uh, what I believe the NDS uh, does for all of us, but specifically, I think, in the terms of strategic logistics, which has significant implications for our ability to project power, and I think it has significant implications for the intelligence community to collect on a much broader scale. So if, uh, if you could put the first slide up. So I'm not going to go back through the strategy with you. I would only say that uh, as you look at the strategy and you look at great power competition, and if you look at the range from day-to-day -day competition to our need and ability to scale up to the very high end of respond. And you think about an environment, right, that forces us to project power at the end of very long and contested lines of communication across all domains. That's a pretty dramatic game changer in challenging the assumptions that we've made in previous times about how we've done deliberate planning and how we've assumed we were going to operate uh, over time. And so uh, if you go to the next slide, you won't be surprised, I don't think, by any of these missions for discombatant command called Transcom. It's emerging just like the missions of DIA and every other organization. When we started in 1987, we were an organization that was break glass only in the time of war. And then you can see the emergence over the arc of missions as we assume them, whether that be global manager for transportation, uh, aerial, aerial medical evacuation, or the assumption of the Joint Enabling Command when JFCOM stood down. But I, what I really wanted to point out to you is a relatively new mission in the latest UCP, which is the Joint Deployment and Distribution Coordinator, which gives the Transcom commander not necessarily directive authority, but a coordinating authority to bring the broader community together to look holistically about our ability to project power and sustain combat power, right? A, a global scale, time and place of our choosing. And, uh, and then look at that from a warfighting perspective and identify gaps and seams for the secretary as we move forward in, against a new security environment. So next slide, if you would. If there was really only three things that I could leave an audience like this, this would probably summarize the three things that I would leave you with. 
So I think you can appreciate, and I don't have to argue with anybody in here, our ability to project power transoceanic distances is a distinct strategic comparative advantage. As a matter of fact, I would argue to you that, and you as intelligence professionals know this better than I, as great power adversaries look at the United States of America, what they really admire most, right, is our ability to globally command and control this incredible network of allies and partners that we have across the globe. And then our ability to project power on a global scale. So you can appreciate that 85% of the joint force resides in the continental United States and must be moved to its point of employment. The second thing uh, I mentioned already really is this uh, emerging environment that we're really living in now, I would argue, at least in the contested phase, but what that might look like against a high-end adversary. And the strategy, I think, lays this out quite nicely, but creates some challenges for us as we look at our ability to project power over time against a higher peer or near-peer competitor in the environment that we look at today. And then the third thing that I would leave you with is uh, probably something that may not be broadly understood is the inextricable link with commercial industry and our commercial industry providers uh, in, in terms of transportation capacity and also in terms of our interfaces with other interagency partners that facilitate our ability to project power, largely uh, across a unclassified domain and largely one that transcends dot .mil to dot .com and dot .gov and other interagency uh, providers. It, uh, it presents, uh, you might appreciate, a very large and complex attack surface. On the other hand, we don't have to defend everything all the time. And there's a kind of an approach, right, on how you, how you approach the triage and how you approach resiliency and how you're interconnected with the geographic combatant commands on how you create the conditions to be able to continue to project power well into the future as a comparative advantage. So if you go to the next slide, what I would uh, describe to you here is what I call kind of the war fighting framework. Now, if you, I didn't, we, we were pretty limited on time today. I didn't bring a, a big HUA video and all that kind of stuff. So you can see ships and trains and, and rail cars and all that kind of stuff being loaded. But it's a great day. It's a great, uh, you know, it's a great day to be the Transcom commander. I'll confess to you that. But what I would say in terms of a war fighting framework, right, the real power of the Transcom enterprise and our ability to shift east, right, to CENTCOM or UCOM, ability to shift west into PACOM or adjacent, SOUTHCOM or, or here in the continental United States with NORTHCOM, Northcom is really this uh, global posture that we have day to day. And I tell my fellow combatant commanders, you know, unlike many of them, I actually have all the authorities that I need as a Transcom commander to operate day in and day out. And I also also have the preponderance of mobility forces assigned to the combatant command U.S. Transcom. So it's very rare that I have to ask for authorities. Uh, you know, in the case where a, a, a geographic combatant commander comes to the table and says, I need a, a force opening package or something to enable an opening of an airfield, uh, I can do that under my own authorities. I can uh, robust the network, shrink the network, uh, and operate inside that network. That gives us an incredible amount of flexibility but that network is predicated upon uh, a strong relationship with allies and partners that ex essentially expand our logistics network for us, as well as uh, predicated upon reliance on commercial, uh, what you might think of as global trade routes, uh, day in and day out. And that offers such a great opportunity uh, that, and there's so much uh, moving in a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, it's very complicated. It's kind of like a needle in a needle stack sometimes. And we watch very closely to see if our high-end adversaries and their reflections as to whether they're able to distinguish between what's moving of significant priority and what's moving as a, as a matter of routine. As you think about uh, uh, you know, machine learning and AI and those kinds of things, and you think about the amount of data that's out there in the system and our ability to see that more clearly, you can see potential uh, in this area. So the global network is fundamentally foundational to everything we do. Secondarily, I would say, is the mobility capacity. So whether that's airlift, aerial refuel, sea lift, whether it's your power projection platforms linked to your seaports of embarkation, but things do have to move and there are physics involved uh, in that process. 
And then the third thing I would argue that uh, from a functional uh, global combatant command perspective, this construct of globally integrated operations and global command and control, I would argue, is a center of gravity that allows us, right, to optimize a network of scarce resources against the secretary and the chairman's priorities. And so in terms of a framework, that's kind of how we view. Now, in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, the intelligence uh, enterprise, and I know my J2's out here somewhere. I haven't been able to pick him out yet. There he is right there. So uh, Henry, thanks for being here today. So, so for him, and he's a, he's a, he's a phenomenal J2. Uh, I got a, a great support by our, our uh, agency reps, national agency reps. Got a great J2. But you can imagine the collection effort against the complicated framework that I just laid out there. And I'll come back to that momentarily. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So what's going on today? Uh, you know, we, you, you could say we're not in phase one operations. You could say we're beyond that, particularly in CENTCOM, AFRICOM, active areas of host, uh, hostility. But as you look at uh, what's going on today in the realm of competition, uh, it's pretty clear in my own view that our adversaries, particularly our high-end adversaries, understand that our ability to project power transoceanic distances is a comparative advantage one that they'd very much like to dismantle, deny, degrade, well before they would have to fight the pointy end of the spear. There's no question about that. And so we see uh, very deliberate uh, 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 activities on the part of adversaries uh, through cyber and cyber reconnaissance. Uh, some of these have uh, uh, been unclassified, declassified, and, uh, and actually released, uh, frankly, if you look back to the GDSS compromised by China about 2004, 2005 time frame. And, and you look at the, the way the Chinese came after that system, uh, not through the front door, but through the back door software development, and not necessarily just through the code, but through the data and the data structure. This is fundamental, right, as you think about what potentially could happen down the road, not just about the disruption of your IT systems, but falsifying information in those IT systems, the level of confidence that you may have. So we're pressing very, very hard at Transcom on uh, cyber mission assurance in a number of areas. And I can talk about that in the Q&A if you'd like me to. Uh, you're well aware of the rest, intellectual property threat, uh, infiltration and acquisition value chains, uh, very interesting. Um, foreign investments and the, re and the real competition, right, for allies and partners. It's an ongoing competitive uh, uh, war every day. Um, and what we see with our adversaries is they don't have the same bifurcation in the way they think about business system or institutional design systems as we do. We tend to you know, separate tactical, operational, strategic, institutional. Our adversaries see this holistically and they're willing to use all instruments of power, economic, state-owned enterprise, et cetera, to, to position themselves in a position of advantage, uh, potentially, uh, in a position that could potentially degrade or de uh, deny our ability to project power. Um, so you can definitely a a appreciate that, I think, in this community and the level of collection. Now, for, for my own perspective, you know, uh, our, our, you know, RJ2, which is a phenomenal organization, has, uh, has always uh, focused predominantly on the, on, the, on the geospatial aspect of intelligence collection, right? Critical nodes, ports, et cetera, et cetera. This is, a, this is a complex and expanding uh, collection effort as to how we understand what our adversary knows and understands about this enterprise, how that presents opportunities for us, and you might be able to think about that, right, and how we can counter and present or, or dilemmas for an adversary. Uh, and so the next slide, I think, is the, uh, the, the last slide, and I'll leave you with this, and I'll go to Q&A because I've got a little bit of time. But uh, this, I think, really frames, in my own view, and the J2 put this together, if you think about the warfighting framework, I got, a, I got a global posture, I got global capacity in terms of transportation, think of onboard platforms, and I've got uh, global command and control, right? And you can think in the level of competition that I just talked about today, all the way through the scale up of a fully mobilized enterprise where we're responding to crisis with a surge force, and the level of challenge to collect. We are oriented for the most part on the far right side where the red is. That's our comfort zone. Um, you know, I, uh, I get great reports on uh, 
the latest surface-to-air weapon system, for example. But on the left side, in this gray zone, in this competition, very, very complex, very difficult, very ambiguous, and it's far, diff far more difficult to understand. But I would argue to you that that's where we set the conditions for se success or uh, failure as we go forward. And I think that's it. I think, uh, I think there's, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. So I'll stop there. I left about eight minutes for uh, Q&A. I really wanted to leave a little bit of time for Q&A, and I'll go wherever you want to go. As long as you don't ask me a tough IT question. I would say to you, though, that um, you know, one of the things that underscores this enterprise is the enormous amount of logistics data, services, uh, DLA, this combatant command, et cetera, et cetera. They're all uh, distinct, de-aggregated. It's an infrastructure that we inherited over time. And, uh, and it's not without its challenges, as you can imagine. So uh, we've taken on some big data kinds of initiatives. We've got an enterprise data environment that we're working with, some use cases that we're developing. And really with the intent of moving from where we are today, which is largely unstructured transactional kinds of data, to how do we move to an environment, a structure to include the cloud that allows us to leverage and harness this big data environment that we have uh, that we just can't quite get our arms around to leverage the advanced computing power that's already there today, uh, but that we're struggling with a little bit. Okay, any, uh, any questions from the audience? I think I'm, I'm, I might be the last one before, before lunch, so. Yeah. Yeah, you have to give them the mic, because uh, yeah, Thank you. I, I apologize. Yes, yeah, sir, do you, do you see our rules of engagement adapting as we increase threats to um, uh, U.S. assets and, uh, and joint assets in the central theory? Uh, to be honest with you, I would say only partially. I think there's a, uh, a high, much higher level of appreciation and awareness. But, you know, when you start to get into these discussions about, uh, you know, all instruments of uh, power, uh, you can't help but to get into a broader discussion about all aspects of government. It's a very, very challenging uh, aspect of a, of a democracy, right, on how you harness all aspects of uh, government to focus on an adversary that's kind of in this low level of competitive space uh, that not everybody appreciates and sees the same way uh, that we do. Um, so I think on the military side, I, I, I think the answer is yes, but I think in other areas, uh, we still have a long way to go, although, although you can see some momentum that's shifting. Well, thanks for the question. Sir, how concerned are you with the, with like the Internet of Things? I mean, now we pay tolls via RFID signal. Shipping containers contain RFID signals for tracking. Um, you know, everything is now in the electronic in the cloud and things like that. Have you shifted a lot of your security concerns to address areas like that? Yeah, no, it's a fair question. So there's uh, kind of two dimensions to this. Again, I kind of alluded this is a fairly large attack service. We're not exactly the quietest enterprise around. Uh, that, you know, that creates, uh, in some ways, that creates opportunities, though. There's so much out there that even, frankly, I find our own, our own Blue Force has a, has a difficult time really understanding uh, what's going on. In fact, I've asked the guys to put a red team together to really kind of take a look and see, hey, what do you... What can you really tell, you know, open source and other sources about what's going on? So it's kind of like a needle in a needle, needle stack sometimes. That presents us some opportunities. I think as we go forward, though, to get to your point, I do think that we've got to balance this tension between how we move, particularly in the unclassified domains that we operate in, uh, to an environment that presents a level of security that's far greater than, it, than exists today. And I think we're moving in that direction, but that's not a direction you get to overnight. We, we've migrated, I think, uh, five or six systems to the cloud. We've got a, a plan to kind of move in that direction, but, you know, security, and there's a couple different options on whether we want to invest in an enterprise off-the-shelf system and what that might bring or might not bring. Um, so, you know, there's, a, there's an operational piece of this, which is my first and foremost uh, priority, and then there's the kind of the how do you run the business, and, and we've got to look at it holistically about what does that mean to vulnerabilities and potential security vulnerabilities. 
So, uh, you know, that's kind of a, not a direct answer to your question because it's a, it's a fairly challenging situation as I look at it. But I don't think it's dire, I guess, is my answer back to you. In other words, we don't have to protect everything 24-7. We have to know what we have to protect our critical information. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's a great question. The question was, uh, given the global mission, uh, would I talk about the interoperability with our allies and partners? Um, you know, it's interesting if you look at an alliance like NATO or, frankly, other, other allies and alliances we have and, and treaties out there. Uh, we do not predicate those on, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's many other areas of interoperability in the area of logistics. It's often the approach that, uh, you know, costs kind of lie where they fall kind of an approach. And, and inherently, either a service or, in this case, a nation, a state, you know, the United States is responsible for logistics. Now, what that creates for us is when we show up, uh, invariably, we're going to have to provide support to allies and partners that we want to bring on the team. And we recognize that. But it's not in the fashion of, a, of an interoperability, uh, technical interoperability perspective. There's a couple examples working out there in Europe, things like Atari's, where there's an exchange. But, but on scale, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the scope of things that I'm willing to go after, uh, that's kind of like uh, way, way out there, uh, kind of like boil the ocean kind of activity. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get to the things that we can get to in the near term. It's a great question, though. And I recognize that we're going to have to support our allies and partners, but we don't, in our planning for force sizing and sufficiency or interoperability, we don't necessarily design in that kind of a fashion. So that's a fair question. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, sir. I think you got the last one. Um, well, that's a fantastic question. Um, we pay a lot of attention to that, and this is this whole piece I was talking about of how well, how do we, how well do we understand the market, how do well do we understand business intelligence. So I'll, I'll use an example for you, and, and, and I think uh, the Navy War College kind of wrote a report on this last year that I think uh, really uh, captured the essence of the issue. And the, when the sea lift industry reorganized, when it was really in a downturn a couple years ago and reorganized and came out, right, with three major alliances. Uh, one of those alliances was led by a French company, uh, CGM, I think is the name of the company, right? And their alliance is with Costco Shipping China. And, and Costco Shipping, as you can appreciate, right, is the, is the leading state-owned enterprise for China that's buying up all the ports globally, uh, owns all the sea lift, include the sea lift that'll support uh, PLA activities, et cetera, et cetera, and also has an alliance with uh, company called uh, APL, which is one of our U.S. flagged companies. So, you know, I engaged the CEO directly on this, and the question was, what does that kind of an alliance mean? Uh, because you have to recognize that our traders have to trade with uh, Asia Pacific, right? I mean, that's the vast majority of the trade. And, uh, but what does that really mean in terms of data sharing and their level of understanding? And right now, it's a pretty clear bifurcation and a pretty clear distinction. But it's something that we watch uh, pretty closely because we're not only competing for allies and partners, we're also competing for, uh, for business partners that we're going to count on, right, that fly the U.S. flag, that we, particularly in the sea lift side, more so than the airlift side. Airlift's a little bit different. So it's a, it's a great question. We spend a fair amount of time uh, focused on that level of market intelligence. We also have a vendor vetting cell. It's probably, I think it's only one of two that are in the department, CENTCOM has one focused on their CENTCOM uh, theater operations, but uh, we have one that Captain Stevenson runs and he looks inside the, uh, the subcontracting networks to make sure that our primes are doing business with the folks that we want to do business with. And we found a few that uh, we didn't want and uh, now we got to kind of work that through the broader acquisition community. But great question. My time went to red and so uh, you got the last question. I appreciate it very much. And uh, let me just say uh, to the community at large, though, really impressive audience. As I looked at the schedule and the agenda, uh, boy, I could see you could get a lot out of this. So, so thanks for what you're doing, and thanks for your commitment, and thanks for your support. We get great support from the intelligence uh, enterprise. And the work that you're doing to really harness data and to figure out how to leverage the computing technology that's out there is really significant, I think, as a warfighting 
multiplier. So thanks for what you're doing, and, and take care. Thanks, Jack. Take care. Thank you very much, General Lyons. Our next speaker is the Honorable David Glowey, who is the Undersecretary for Inten Intelligence and Analysis at the Department of Homeland Security. I've had the pleasure of actually working with Mr. Glowey at ODNI when he was the Deputy NIM for Threat Finance and International Organized Crime. He has over 26 years of national security and law enforcement experience and recently served as the Assistant Commissioner of the Office of Intelligence at the Customs and Border Protection Agency protection organization. Early in his career, he served in law enforcement as a police officer in Houston, and then as a federal agent with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Glowey. All right, well, uh, good afternoon. We're just clicking into the afternoon. Um, it's a real honor to be here. It's a real privilege. Um, on, uh, on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security and the men and women of uh, an organization of almost 250,000 people, it, it's an honor to be able to, to, to come and, uh, and speak with you today. I also want to thank uh, General Ashley for hosting me today, as well as acknowledging Je Jack Gumtow for your leadership in bringing together this important event. Um, and just real quickly on my background, I currently serve as the Chief Intelligence Officer for the Department of Homeland Security and also the Chief Information Sharing Officer for the Department of Homeland Security. Um, I have almost 27 years in service, starting as a police officer in Houston and then into this position today. And just a little bit about my background, and I think it br brings a unique, I guess, wisdom and experience that maybe a few others have had, and I'm only going to walk you through that just to give you those examples. So when I was 22 years old, um, I grew up in Iowa, born and raised, went to college there, and um, my whole life goal was to be an FBI agent. I had visited the J. Edgar Hoover building when I was, was very young. My mom and dad weren't very, well, let's just say I grew up in an austere I mean, My mom was a kindergarten teacher. My dad was a farmer and accountant. And um, we had two trips we took. Um, never, never on an airplane, hadn't been on an airplane until I was in my 20s. And we went to Disney World, we saved up all our money, and then as a kindergarten teacher you have to go to Washington to understand how government works. And I visited the J. Edgar Hoover building and did the FBI tour, and that changed my life and my, where I wanted to go. Um, but to get there was quite a path. And the experiences that I had, starting as the youngest patrol officer in Houston, I was 22 years old when I entered the academy, um, and it was the violent crime capital of the United States, um, a very, uh, very violent time. Transnational criminal organizations had taken over Houston. And responding to countless violent scenes, either from violent crime, natural disasters and hurricanes, or from accidents, I, en I encountered numerous individuals that the worst day of their life had happened was when I showed up. And when I get up every morning, my team that I'm with, my goal is to institutionalize to prevent the worst day from happening in someone's life. Prevent the worst day from happening in someone's life. So when I left Houston, I was fortunate enough to go to Aurora, Colorado, Aurora and Denver in 1997. For those of you who remember the, the metropolitan area of Denver, we had the first, one of the first, horrific mass shootings involving a school in Columbine. I was part of the metropolitan area that responded and, and worked at the Columbine scene after the event. Also, uh, following up, when I got hired by the FBI under the tactical hiring program, the horrific events of 9-11, and being the FBI agent that wrote the program to attack our Al-Shabaab threat on the homeland when we had all the young kids traveling from Minneapolis and other cities. How are we going to align our organizations from a strategic and tactical approach to mitigate those threats? Moving on to the Director of National Intelligence, appointed as the first transnational organized crime and, and threat finance Deputy National Intelligence Manager, how do we align our government and our big data systems to identify the vulnerabilities using financial intelligence? What are our data solutions? Who do we incorporate into that programs? Where do we find those solutions? 
very fortunate enough uh, under some, some leadership at the DNI that allowed me to develop a tool with DARPA and the Undersecretary of Defense to allow us to what took six weeks in, in bulk data down to two days. And then be, before this position was recruited to be the head of intelligence for U.S. Customs and Border Protection, the U.S.'s largest law enforcement organization. Border Patrol, Office of Air and Marine, and as well as our Office of Field Operations, which is the old customs officers, which are the blue shirts. Aligning their organization strategically and tactically, looking at how data solutions can be incorporated on some of the world's biggest data. Just as an example, U.S. Customs and Border Protection processes over one million passengers a day that enter the United States through point of entries or between the ports. Approximately 72,000 pieces of cargo, I'm sorry, 72,000 vehicles and approximately 40,000 pieces of cargo to facilitate lawful trade and travel. How do you align an organization of 65,000 people looking at data solutions and operational needs to combine that to have outputs that mitigate threats? And then lastly, in this current position, so a little background, I knew uh, Secretary Kelly when he was the Southcom commander and I was an FBI agent. And uh, on, uh, after President Trump had been elected, I got a phone call and said, David, I'd like you to be the acting undersecretary at the Department of Homeland Security Office of Intelligence and Analysis. They wanted somebody with law enforcement intelligence experience. And I said, Roger that, sir. They put my name forward to President Trump, and subsequently I was unanimously confirmed by the United States Senate in July of 2017. Um, I am blessed to be in this position. To think that a 22-year-old police officer in Houston that grew up in Iowa that hadn't even been on an airplane until his 20s would be the undersecretary of the largest, third largest department in the U.S. government and head of intelligence is a real honor and privilege to be with you today. And I stake my head every day I'm here and just can't believe it. But again, it comes back to how do we create the systems and processes in place to mitigate threats? And what I'm gonna to talk to you today is about the structural organization, the Department of Homeland Security, the intelligence enterprise, and how we're meeting the needs of our customers, our state and local and our private sector partners, as well as our US intelligence community, DOD and law enforcement at the federal level. So as I mentioned, our, our operations are staggering in the Department of Homeland Security. We process over a million passengers today, and my mistake here, over 200,000 privately owned vehicles and 70,000 pieces of cargo. And that's every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week to, uh, to facilitate lawful trade and travel. We screen and issue immigration benefits, block cyber intrusions, investigate a range of Homeland Security threats and conduct enforcement operations. Every day, the men and women of the Department of Homeland Security protect your communities. As the Undersecretary for Intelligence, I also serve as the Chief Information Officer for the Department. I've leveraged these authorities to realign our intelligence enterprise to effectively mitigate threats by focusing the Department where we add value and getting timely and actual intelligence to our customers. The scale and the and scope of the threats we are facing are posing significant challenges to the homeland. That is going to require enhanced and new partnerships like we haven't seen before specifically with the private sector. To respond to these threats, we faced, we took best practices across government and aligned the intelligence capabilities of 22 agencies to create a dominant intelligence enterprise. Through mission centers, which is best practices we've learned in a post 9-11 environment, we brought together the critical sets in a team of teams approach. Collection, exploitation for strategic and tactical resolution for good policy decisions and operational decision making. The Cyber Mission Center is the premier provider for cyber threat analysis to enable the department's mission for cybersecurity and resiliency of the .gov network. The Economic Security Mission Center, the most newly formed center within the Department of Homeland Security to identify the threats to our trade and financial institutions in partnership with other law enforcement intelligence community and private sector partners is the department's center of gravity focused on intelligence to identify foreign investment, trade, and financial interests and threats to those institutions. One of our core missions at the department is to facilitate lawful trade and travel, as I mentioned. An economic security mission center provides a critical analysis in support of this mission. The Transnational Organized Crime Mission Center. And as I mentioned before, I was the first Deputy National Intelligence Manager for Transnational Organized Crime for the U.S. government. And I also served on the National Security Council and helped draft, uh, at that time, President Obama's strategy on transnational organized crime. A couple key takeaways about transnational organized crime and the way it erodes institutions and governments. 
It destabilizes countries. It destabilizes countries. We in the department primarily focus on drug smuggling organizations, transnational criminal gangs, human smuggling, weapons traffics, child exploitation, illicit trade, and the movement of illicit proceeds on behalf of these enterprises. These cartels and organizations are a multi-billion dollar industry, multi-billion dollar industry. The work of our mission center is incredibly important because this poses a significant threat to our national security, and it has for decades. As I mentioned, they erode institutions, they corrupt governments, and they destabilize countries. And it devastates our communities in the United States, as I mentioned, seeing it firsthand in Houston. Last year, we had over 70,000 overdoses in the United States, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. A few statistics, just so you know, the magnitude of transnational criminal organizations. And I'm focusing on this for a couple points, because this was not initially a threat brief for you all. Um, Transnational criminal organizations and the narcotics trafficking and the narcotics use in our communities are devastating. I would probably argue that most everyone in this room has had been impacted by some sort of narcotics abuse um, or narcotics use that's affected your families, your friends, or significant others. U.S. Customs and Border Protections in two between 2015 saw an 18% increase in cocaine seizures. But the one, the one asterisk to that number, which is 20% is still significant, is the purity level is up to almost 90%. Why is that? The purity level is to increase the addiction rates for those that are using it, to increase that high by the cartels. Methamphetamine increased 141% in the same time frame. And of course, fentanyl is up 2,400%. Just to give an illustration of fentanyl, 2.2 pounds of pure fentanyl from a Mexican cartel or from China purchased for approximately $5,000, fits in a shoebox, is worth approximately $1.5 million when it's dissipated, and has the potency to kill a half million people. Wow, a half million people. All right, moving on to foreign intelligence, counterintelligence. The Counterintelligence Mission Center identifies current and emergency, emerging counterintelligence threats facing the Department of Homeland Security enterprise, as well as our customer set, as I mentioned earlier. I state local and private sector partners. With the intelligence community, the center identifies networks, implements countermeasures, and enhances resiliency across the intelligence enterprise. The Counterterrorism Mission Center, the hub for integrating the department's domestic and international counterterrorism mission and intelligence focal point for collaboration throughout our state, local, tribal, territorial, international, private sector intelligence community partners. This center produces all source finished intelligence at the lowest classification level to enable policy, decision making, strategic alignment of resources, and tactical resolution. And this is in partnership with our law enforcement and FBI partners on the homeland. The key, in my opinion, is early threat detection. In my time as the Undersecretary, we launched several initiatives to help our state and local partners with early threat identification and prevention of violent acts. This urgency and restructuring was evident in the unfortunate and horrific shootings that have occurred in El Paso, Texas, and Dayton, Ohio. As the virtual world expands and the insulation to identify this extremist becomes more difficult, how are we creating the infrastructure to identify it? How are we partnering with you to come up with data solutions and enterprise approach to find those ways to off-ramp individuals that used to be engaged at the community level in a person-to-person -person peer group. Early threat, early threat identification is critical. Early threat identification is critical. So what have we done? And where do we have some opportunities? We recently created the open source, the open source collection team. It's a 24-7 capability within my office, the Department of Homeland Security. Their job is to identify threats on the deep and the dark web, as you can see from our slide. This was a capability we did not have in the, homeland, in the Department of Homeland Security. This is newly created. Their job every day is to find threats against life and property, to find threats against life and property. And to say that this, they are overworked and understaffed is an understatement. We are getting additional resources to this, but the data solutions, the data solutions we need help with resides, I'm sure, somewhere in this audience. 
How do we increase that capability to identify those threats? Of course, protecting that First Amendment speech. Protecting the First Amendment speech. As I've reviewed this, and I know many of you have, what is being said or what is being put on this, it is horrific. The offensive statements, the racial, the religious, the sexual orientation is awful. But there is First Amendment protected speech in that. My goal here, and there are legal authorities, is to identify those threats against persons and property. To identify that and to use that data to exploit it, to get it to our customers, to get it to, our, to a tactical resolution to prevent the worst days from happening in people's lives, as I mentioned before. To give you an idea of our, our threat reporting number on domestic terrorism, from 2000 and 2000, 2017 to 2018, we had 138 percent increased in our finished and tactical domestic terrorism reporting. And I expect those numbers to be similar in 2019. Our tactical reporting on threats to persons or property was up 173 percent from 2017 to 2018. How do we disseminate our information? Through the Homeland Security Information Network. We send this reporting to our state and local law enforcement partners through the Homeland Security Information Network, our secure platform for sharing unclassified intelligence. And for those of you that do not have an account, I would highly encourage you to get one. The law enforcement portal of this information network currently holds over 40,000 products. We broke this down recently into the mission centers. So what I asked my folks to do was for an end user, I wanted to make it as simple as possible for someone wanting to understand foreign intelligence threats, transnational criminal organizations, or terrorism. It's an easy to find point and click to find the recent products of interest. So what is success in that? In 2018, in 2018 we, we put 8,000 more products on this site. And to give you an idea, from 2017 to 2018, clicks. So how many people are actually using it? I saw a 325% increase in viewing the products from 2017 to 2018. The open source reports, which I mentioned before, represents 56% of those views. I would say that's successful. Suspicious activity reporting, SAR reporting. In partnership with the FBI, we've expanded what a suspicious activity is to all threats and all crimes. So not strictly just focused on terrorism, it's reporting mechanism, training our state and local private sector of how to identify threats and how to get that threat information to the state fusion centers as well as to the FBI and local law enforcement for mitigation. And I'm going to talk about some opportunities here for some data solutions here shortly. So what we required, and I do the training, the virtual training for this and the in-person, is we needed to exponentially increase this. And this wasn't in regard just to the, the domestic terrorism threats that we're facing today. This was in regard to all threats when I came over to the organization. Is how are we restructuring? How are we getting our training out so people can identify their threats? So that they can report on their threats. How to report on their threats. Our reporting numbers are, are there for you for as far as the training. 32,983 in 17, 41,000 some in fiscal year 2018 and 54,000 this year. This was also part of the, is going to be part of the, the grant program for FEMA that's going to be required training. If you get grant money from the Department of Homeland Security, you will have to have acquired this training. So where are some opportunities? Where are some opportunities? And this is going to go back to, uh, to my career in local law enforcement. So I currently run multiple advisory boards for um, our state and local uh, and private sector partners. And a lot of it focuses on data and data solutions. And many of you know that the key to data solutions is identifying the outputs that are needed. So you're not just creating tools to create tools, is what is our output needed in hand and glove with the operational needs? What are we trying to do at the end? And as I mentioned, on the simplest is to prevent the worst day from happening in someone's life. All right. So what are some data solutions that we need to execute today? And what, do I, what have I seen that are effective? So in the emergency management systems, and I'm going to walk through this fairly slowly, but I want to, I want to make sure I articulate this correctly. Computer data dispatch, CAD systems. So you call 911, and I'll use myself as an example, any of you. You call 911, and it goes into a, computer, a dispatch center, and it goes into, and generally, a computer data dispatch. And the call for service is entered. Dave Glowey, uh, or an unknown male, unknown name male, is 
is acting bizarre, acting crazy, walking down the middle of the road. So that's essentially a welfare check or a, a, a disorderly conduct. Usually that will respond is a law enforcement officer will go contact the individual. If it doesn't result in arrest, it just results in, in a contact, my information would be captured by the, by the police officer. It would be typed into a CAD system, Dave Glowey, my name, date of birth, and my address. Um, if there's no warrants, and it's not going to result in arrest, which it might not, um, and I'm let go to a family, to a friend, or, or something else, that just goes into the CAD system. Dave Glowey was contacted, and I'll use Houston as an example, in the Houston Police Department. Next call. Dave Glowey um, is at his mom and dad's house, and he's threatening his dad. Going to get in a fight, domestic violence. Police responds to Dave Glowey's house. There's no weapons. There's no physical altercation. There's no, no probable cause for an arrest, or maybe even if there was. That goes into a police report or into the CAD system as a call for service. Dave Glowey, same, same situation. We'll say it's outside of Houston, Harris County. Um, is laying in the front yard of 123 Main Street, um, unknown cause. Gets there, I've overdosed on some sort of a narcotics or alcohol. Again, that goes into a CAD system, computer data dispatch. And then lastly, Dave Glowey has a knife. He's standing on the front lawn and threatening people. Now, they get police resolve. Again, it could, it could result in an arrest, probably would. All that goes into a computer-aided dispatch, which I didn't mention there is terrorism. I didn't mention any mass shootings. But what I did say, mention was multiple different scenarios where Dave Glowey was contacted by law enforcement, and there was a violent tendency. On my social media account, somewhere here, potentially, I'm chatting about my violent tendencies. I'm sending pictures. I'm sending messages regarding my violent tendencies to potentially commit an act of violence. My question from a data solution, and I know these already exist because there's two organizations I've studied and I've gone out and seen their programs. How do you capture that CAD data? Because you run thousands of calls for service in, in a lot of metropolitan areas, or even you know, hundreds in, in smaller. How do you capture that CAD data? How do you identify potential violence? How do you capture social media where you lawfully can do that? Again, threats to property or person. And how do you create an output so you can do an interdiction? That's my question. So I've seen two programs right now, and under the, the, the horrific shootings in Las Vegas, they have this. They have nine jurisdictions, I believe, nine or so, maybe may have not got the number perfectly right there, on capturing that data in their CAD system, overlaying that with school resource officer data, other data sets that's through an artificial intelligence overlay that puts a lead out every day to a watch commander. And they have a crisis intervention team that goes out and does knock and talks with individuals. It could be social services. It could be religious clergy. It could be academic professionals. It could be law enforcement. And it's voluntary. It's a knock and talk, which means they voluntarily go knock and talk. But it's giving them an opportunity to go find a potential violent or threat actor. The same program I saw in West Virginia. But it's not for violent acts. It's for opium overdoses. So every day, through the computer data dispatch and the calls for service, they get a run or a list of all the address they went out where someone had overdosed. And they go with an interdiction team to try to off-ramp them into some sort of diversionary program for treatment. These are very unique programs. Now you think, oh, this is standardized across the United States. It's not. It's not. So how do you create data solutions starting with state and local law enforcement and engagement with the private sector to find those outputs to find at-risk individuals? Now, unfortunately, you're going to say, well, this is something the federal government can solve at the macro level. You know, we can do the suspicious activity reporting. You can go up through Department of Homeland Security to the FBI. No. That's not realistic. This is going to have to be at the state and local law enforcement level. We can create the institution, the programmatics, which I just explained it, to come up with some data solutions. But this will likely have to be with all 50 state governments and even potentially down to the municipalities because the information sharing agreements are local or within the state, how the data is held, and the authorities, they can exploit it and have the outputs. But that's the solution. That's the solution that I, that I 
I recognize after doing this for almost 27 years and where the vulnerability is at. And I can tell you from looking at Las Vegas and looking from West Virginia and where their program's at, they're very successful. They're very successful. But it's going to create, but it's going to require some very innovative scientists, some very innovative engineers, some very in creative individuals to identify how we can use these systems, how we can partner with social media, absorb that, and get these into these computer data dispatch, these CAD systems or record management systems at the state and local law enforcement level to create an output for a crisis intervention. And this isn't just regarding terrorism or active shooters that can be overdosed. This can, be, this can have an, uh, a, an applicability to multiple different threat vectors. And I mentioned from Las Vegas to West Virginia, their outputs were very different. But again, it comes down to crisis intervention. And it's not always going to be a law enforcement resolution with handcuffs on. It's, a, it's an intervention, a diversionary program and for all options on the table. So what else are we doing on the macro level within the Department of Homeland Security? The National Vetting Center, NVC. Another way the US government and technology is through our National Vetting Center. Previously, information sharing and vetting relied on ad hoc processes. The department and our interagency partners launched a unique and unified approach. Established pursuant to the National Security Presidential Memorandum, NSPM 9, the National Vetting Center is a collaborative interagency effort the center provides a platform for integrated data and collaboration to identify threats to national security, border security, homeland security, or public safety posed by individuals seeking to transit our borders or exploit our immigration system. It allows departments and agencies to con contribute their unique information and strengthens and streamlines the complex way that data intelligence is exploited to identify unknown threats and make operational decisions. It also ensures compliance with the, within applicable laws and policies while maintaining robust privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties protections. The National Vetting Center allows DHS to expand vetting to all national security threats. Our modernization and move to cloud services will provide our analysts at the National Vetting Center and across the enterprise to deeper, deeper technical solutions to identify those nefarious actors trying to cross our borders. In our election efforts, elections are vital to a free and fair society and a cornerstone of American democracy. A secure and resilient electoral process is vital to our national interests and the Department of Homeland Security. As we saw in the 2018 midterm elections, we worked with our state and local partners to deploy teams of cyber experts to help secure their systems. We surged intelligence operations throughout the United States and had multiple lines of effort. The Department of Homeland Security conducted over 14,000 engagements in all 50 states and territories. I'm very proud of this number. And our organization, the Office of Intelligence Analysis, presided 90%, 90% of all intelligence that secured the 2018 midterm elections. That was because of the creation of the Cyber Mission Center in alignment with the Field Operations Division and the new Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency that was created in the department. We are present in 79 fusion centers and is the touch point in ongoing preparation for the 2020 election. As we look to the 2020 election, DHS is committed to work collaboratively with those on the front lines of election, with our state and local and government election officials, federal partners, and the vendor community to manage the risk to the election infrastructure. Again, we will always remain transparent as well as agile to combat and secure our physical and cyber infrastructure against new and evolving foreign intelligence threats. In organizations across government, I've consistently, cyber, I've consistently seen cyber records and information technology professionals referred to as supporting elements. Support. That's fingernails on the chalkboard to me. I hate the term support. It's mission readiness. It's mission readiness. Support doesn't describe the excellent work you deliver every day or the excellent work my staffs deliver every day. If you're not directly involved in operations, then you are enabling our mission readiness capabilities. Our national security depends on our ability to enable early threat identification and deliver actionable intelligence to our partners. We need your help to leverage machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence. We need to keep pace with the ever-changing and emerging technology of our adversaries. 
We must always endeavor to maintain the trust of our citizens and ensure compliance with applicable laws and policies while maintaining robust privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties protections. We have an incredible opportunity. The demands are very high, but I know the tenacity and willingness to take on the greatest national security challenges. The American people and our global partners deserve nothing yet. And I just want to close by saying thank you to the sacrifices to you and your family and what you do every day. And I just want to end with what I started with. Our goal collectively is to prevent the worst day from happening in someone's life. And I just wanted to thank you for everything you do every day and the sacrifices you make. Thank you.